Hello everybody, so today we are here going to be talking about 20th century environmental issues. I'm not going to lie, this one is going to be a little bit of a drag, but we're going to establish some baselines for some of the problems that we're facing in the 20th century and then move on in my next video to talk about some of the successes that we were having in dealing with the environment. And so basically what um, a lot of people are trying to look at today is um, geologically, we have been put in the Holocene era. That is what we are doing right now. However, many geologists and other scientists have been moving toward changing the time periods of the eras and introducing a new era known as the Anthropocene era, which is the age of man. And the idea here is that because of the massive and drastic changes that the Industrial Revolution has caused and the massive expansion of technology, businesses, etc., specifically since 1950, we really are in a new era. And we're seeing dramatic climatic changes, geological changes, and then as a result, we're we could argue that we are in the new Anthropocene era. So what are the problems that we're looking at in the environment? Well, there's a lot. Uh, one of them is the issues with carbon dioxide. Now, what you see here is the standard carbon cycle, which basically has things like uh, the weather or animals and humans causing carbon or carbon dioxide to get into the atmosphere. However, that is counteracted by photosynthesis in both marine and terrestrial environments, which thus creates oxygen. And we have a system that should work well for all of us. But the problem is, is that is being disturbed now. Um, we are seeing too much atmospheric carbon dioxide uh, with the massive industrialization that we've had and use of fossil fuels and stuff like that. As a result, we are looking at increased global temperatures, potential increase in hurricane frequency, issues with sea level rise, uh, issues with salinity due to the flooding of fresh water, and a variety of different issues, mainly because we have too much carbon dioxide that is still in the atmosphere and in the ground where it really shouldn't be. And that is, you can argue, that is mainly as a direct relation from human activity. Now, another thing we have here is depletion of water reserves and desertification. Desertification, the climate in the world is changing, and we are having geographic and geological changes. And if we look here, one of those is deserts. And so if you look in the red, those are areas that are desert. So that's a lot of area in the world. And the yellow is areas that are vulnerable to becoming deserts. Um, we used to never see this in South America, uh, with the exception of like the Atacama and stuff like that. Now we're starting to see expand there. Look at how little green is left in Africa um, and Australia, looking the possible expansion into Europe and much of Central and Southern Asia. This is an issue because, of course, you can't really expand um agriculture if you're dealing with the actual desert. It's really, really tricky. Um, and I know, yes, this map is from 2012, but you know, a map from 2020 isn't going to be much different. In fact, it actually might be worse. Um, this right here is an example of nations who are struggling with water scarcity, with the fact that they have scarce amounts of water to use, the yellows are good, orange not so good, and of course the reds are really, really bad. And so we see here lack of access to regular fresh water is a problem across the globe. And when you have issues with uh, access to water and increased desertification, we have areas where the soil is degrading. And so even if we don't have 
um, desert or sand, you still have soil that might not be good. And as you can see, much of the world has issues with potential instability in the soil. That's something I'll talk about in class. We also have issues in the oceans. We have parts of the oceans are dying um, with algae blooms, issues with uh, resources or, you know, uh, oxygenation is basically gone in these areas. You're looking at fish deaths. You're looking at plankton deaths. And it's really, really rough in the oceans here. And continuing on, we have lots of things that aren't biodegradable and don't break down over time. Humans make a lot of trash and, you know, concrete and plastics are the worst. Concrete just takes forever to break down. And yes, it's good in buildings, but over time, um, chemicals out of it can leach and cause problems in soil and stuff like that. And of course, plastic on plastic on plastic, as you see here, just to give you an idea of how damaging plastic can be. If you've ever had a bottle of water and you read that there's an expiration date on it, the expiration date is not from the water. Okay, water can go bad because it gets contaminated, but regular water is fine. It's for actually the plastic bottle that it's in because it can degrade and leach into uh, the water, which can cause you problems. And just the amount of trash, the damage that plastics cause, it's really, really huge. Uh, we're also dealing with animal and plant extinctions that I'm going to go into. These are just some examples of uh, different types of animals that are critical or have actually gone extinct in, you know, the past century or so. I'll talk about some um, as we move forward, but some people say the Holocene into the Anthropocene now is one of the largest time periods of mass extinction that we've had in the history of of the world, and that's going back four billion years. Now, what are these human impacts? Well, one of the things is, is that we change the environment a lot, and a lot of it is because we need to eat. We need to eat a lot of food. Uh, just to give you an idea, right now, okay, by two, in 2015, 40% of the world's land is used to create food for humans or used for pasture land for animals that we're going to eat. In 1750, that percentage was 4%. We also have increased our irrigation demands by 900% over just the 20th century. Okay, so when you look at those things, you can see by some of the problems that I told you earlier that the scarcity and shortage is a big, big deal. And this is because we are actually crafting and changing the environment over, which can be problematic. Which one of the big outcomes, you know, I, I, I gave you a bunch of other problems before, but as a result of the pasture land and stuff like that, we are seeing massive levels of deforestation. Probably the best example is the Amazon rainforest. Since the mid-1960s, approximately 20% of the Amazon rainforest has been cut down. Um, tropical areas like Latin America, Africa, and Southeast Asia have seen the largest losses of jungle and forest in the world. Um, much of this goes back hundreds of years, and if not thousands of years, also to the building of cities, okay? And that you're clear-cutting all this land to build massive cities, which does reduce the trees, which actually hurts our, you know, uh, the carbon cycle that we want to have happen to us. Um, and also mining, you have strip mining and other forms of mining and the chemicals that are used for mining that leach into water and then just the destruction of the overall land. This is a major, major issue. We also have the impact on animals. Um, <clears throat> biodiversity is all the different animals and plants that live in the world. And it's super important. Basically the world is kind of like, you know, a, a body, if you will, like our body. And it's made of a variety of different systems and different animals and plants have different roles within that system. And so if you start to pull things out of the system, it can break down. Um, we need certain animals to do certain things. Um, a great example of you know, humans rely on tons and tons of fish. It's an economic thing. It's also a nutrition thing. But to give you an idea of how much we're overfishing and damaging our um, our fish population, if you look up there, this is the um, Grand Banks Cod Fishery, which is a huge cod fishery off the coast of Newfoundland, which is where we were getting tons and tons of Atlantic cod, right? And if you look at the numbers there, the blue is, is how much we were yielding 
okay and how things were going and then all of a sudden we get this huge collapse down all the way to 1992 that it reaches almost zero and then we have to try to rebuild it um we had basically this was a huge percentage of the world's fish that we eat virtually collapsed to the point where the canadian government actually had to ban fishing there i mean it's absolutely destruction <clears throat> you're seeing all the issues with bees and hive collapse and we are trying to figure out why and that's so important for you know, fertilizing different and pollinating different types of plants and making sure that we have um, the the plant diversity that we have in the world that's really, really crucial. The bees are crucial for that. Um, we've also had a variety of different animals go extinct. Uh, Spix's macaw, you might see there. If you ever saw the, uh, there was a movie about the Spix's macaw. Um, it's escaping me right now. Rio, there we go. The movie called Rio uh, about these macaws and how endangered they are. They're now all gone. Okay, uh, the puli, which is a different type of bird, Indo-Chinese tigers, they're now all gone, and the Yangtze soft cell turtles, these were animals that all went extinct just in the year 2018. Some other issues that we're having, um, quick industrialization, um, China is one of the world's biggest polluters. They do some good things with renewable energy, but... They, and we'll talk about them in economics, but you had a massive economic change, massive industrialization, but huge burning of coal. And as a result, um, by the early 2000s, 12 of the world's 20, 20 most polluted places in the world were actually in China. I know particularly Linfen was a city that was highest on that list. Walking around in Linfen during the day, basically breathing the air was the equivalent of smoking two packs of cigarettes. Um, so absolutely devastating. By the late 1980s, half of all the rivers in the USSR were actually deemed heavily polluted. And those rivers actually served 20% of their population. So that's not good. We had the massive use of chlorofluorocarbons, which is basically a chemical that we used in a variety of things, particularly like spray cans and stuff like that. Um, and unfortunately, what we discovered is that those chl chlorofluorocarbons got into the air and actually started to eat away at our ozone layer. And we had different parts of the world where the ozone layer had either thinned or there had been holes in it. The problem with that is that that allows extra harmful UV rays, as you see there in the diagram, to reach the earth. And we see increase in number of skin cancers and stuff like that. Um, another example is the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. This is a garbage patch that is 7 million square miles in the North Pacific. Let's look at it. This is actually the main one that I'm going to show you, but there's actually another one that because of the currents just kind of swirl around. And this is an example of, uh, whoop, not too quick, of all of those types of things. And then along with that, we have man-made environmental disasters. I'm going to just bring up two, the Bhopal chemical disaster. This is just terrifying. Um, this is a massive industrial plant, um, the United Carbide plant in Bhopal, India. And in 1984, there was a massive gas leak and over 500,000 people were exposed to methyl isocyanate. If you see you know, cyanate, we know that that is no good. Um, it killed anywhere from 2,500 to 8,000 people. Many of these deaths happened later due to exposure, so we're still trying to figure out the actual numbers, but it's 2,500 on the small end. Definitely, I think the numbers are much, much higher. Um, over 500,000 people were injured. That's a solid number, um, with tens of thousands of them actually being injured permanently. And let me give you some examples. On the top left there, you see two boys who... Um, had developed disabilities as a result of the chemical exposures. Um, on the bottom left, you see all the dead bodies being laid out. And on the right, you can see kind of the gas as it starts to slowly but surely envelop the city. Um, just, just devastating. A variety of people will go to jail for this later on, but, but it's just pretty, pretty terrible. And of course, one of the most infamous, the Chernobyl nuclear disaster, which was really unparalleled in size and scope. Um, this is in a Pripyat, USSR, modern-day Ukraine. It occurred in 1986, and basically what you ended up having <clears throat> were, due to massive human error, huge explosions happened inside the plant, and massive amounts of radiation were released. Um, two immediately were killed. 28, later, 28 people would die later as a result of radiation poisoning early on. 
However, 48,000 people had to be evacuated from the city. It is a ghost town now. Radiation, as you'll see, Mac, was so widespread, though, into the client states and other areas of the USSR, some people will attribute long-term deaths from this from anywhere from 9 to 16,000. It really depends on trying to track down if they can prove that it was the exposure to that radiation that caused those early deaths. The area is so contaminated that according to experts, we'll see right now, that it actually won't be truly cleaned up until the year 2065, which was actually 80 years after the accident. So here is what was left of the plant, as you can see here, not good. Um, this gives you the extent of the radiation that reached all the way over based on prevailing winds to Spain and the United Kingdom. Actually, it was radiation. The, the Russians actually do try to cover it up, but it's radiation detectors in, in uh, Finland up here and Sweden that actually detected mass amounts of um, radiation, because you got to remember all of these nations right through here, this is all still part of the Soviet Union at the time, okay? And so, so basically all of this was Soviet Union, so they can keep that covered up for a while, but once it got out to here, Finland and Sweden, then they were like, whoa, something's wrong, and it was really, really terrible. Um, here on the left you see is a basically what was left of, of a little amusement park in the town. On the right is the massive dome that was built around it to try to contain it. On a side note, now that there aren't any humans there, massive expansion of wildlife. Uh, we see like buffalo and deer, and actually I think those are moose, um, and a giant black bear. You've got a lynx, which you almost never see. But as you can see, the fact of the matter is there's been some pretty rough goings for the environment. Lots of it caused by human uh, intervention, sadly. The question is, though, are there things that we can do to bring it back? Can we recover? Can we fix it? And what are those things to do? And that's what I'll get into in my next video. Okay, guys, thanks for stopping by. See you soon.